Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. This is Tho Bishop. No Ryan for this episode, but I'm joined by my good friend, Mises U alum and policy director for the Sound Money Defense League, JP Cortez. JP, how are you doing? Hey, Tho, I'm doing great. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Uh, I'm excited for this episode. Um, you know, Joe Biden earlier this week, I think, made a statement that had some legitimacy. We, we will occasionally admit that on this show. Um, but he was talking about how Republicans really don't have any sort of solution for the inflation question. Uh, earlier this week, we saw Republicans sign off with you know the, the rest of the Democrats, kind of the, the uniparty at action with a $40 billion Ukrainian bill. Um, those same Republicans will be going out there today talking about Biden inflation, seeing no connection, how, how one leads to the other. No surprise there. Um, but I think that does open up a very interesting policy environment where, you know, there, for all of the, the money pumped into D.C., very little attention is placed on the monetary issue. Um, even people kind of within our orbit, you know, there's a lot of intellectual pursuits and obviously the Mises Institute has many scholars dedicated to some of that. Um, but it strikes me that the idea that we're going to come in and reform the Fed with some sort of new generation of free market uh, monetary thinkers is perhaps uh, e even more delusional, if you will, than uh, any sort of faith in electoral politics. And that's why I I'm always excited to see the updates from what you've been doing for several years now. And I know uh, we were talking off air how you've had a busy year, um, but issues dealing with real money in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better world, right? Gold and money, um, how there's things that we can do at the state level to help uh, support alternatives to the dollar. Um, and then, of course, federal issues are going to be a kind of a, a different thing itself. But uh, JB, can you just uh, tell a little bit uh, with our audience here, you know, what it is that the Sound Money Defense League does and what are some of the projects that you've been working on? Yeah, absolutely. So the Sound Money Defense League is a, a national uh, nonpartisan policy project. Uh, it was started in about 2016. Uh, so for about seven years now, we have worked to remonetize gold and silver, a constitutional sound money. Uh, and what we have found is that uh, there is so much that states can do to help alleviate some of the damage that's done on the federal level by the feds and the Federal Reserve. And so the easiest way that we've found to remonetize gold and silver is through uh, state laws and taxation. Uh, there's a lot of taxation surrounding uh, the use, the purchase, the sale of gold and silver. Um, and so the, the dysfunction that we're seeing here today uh, on as far as these un unseen levels of inflation in, in several decades, you know, stem from the federal level, absolutely no doubt. But states don't have to be a party, don't have to be victim to the damage done by the states. Uh, so the, the the plan is to, to knock down any state impediments to uh, buying, owning, selling precious metals. So that's in some states, there are states that charge sales tax uh, when you purchase precious metals. Um, in most states and on the federal level, you're going to get hit with an income tax. If you sell when there's a gain, uh, you have to report that gain and you're taxed on that. Um, and there are just plenty of disincentives to keeping people from using gold and silver as money, using them as an inflation hedge, which it has been for thousands of years. Um, and so states are, are waking up to the fact that they can do something about this problem. While the problem is largely a federal one, they can still do things to mitigate the damage. And more than ever, we're seeing states, individuals within those states, uh, the politicians within those states, and even states themselves realizing that gold and silver today more than ever at a time of high inflation and geopolitical uncertainty is unbelievably important. And so to remove any of the penalties to getting into that uh, are are of the utmost importance and states are realizing that and laws all over are being passed to remove sales taxes, remove disincentives, remove any of the friction into and out of the U.S. dollar. So can you tell, talk about some of the progress you've been making this year? I know uh, Alabama, um, you had a big victory there on, on a, a with sales tax exemption, right, for gold exactly. and silver. Um, I, I think Virginia was another battleground that you guys had had this year. Can you talk about some of the states that you've had uh, some success, uh, not only this year, but perhaps some some recent years prior to this? Yeah, absolutely. So just this year uh, that we have been busy, the Sound Money Defense League has been working 24 pieces of legislation across 11 different states. This is legislation that uh, tackles the sales tax issue, the capital gains issue. Uh, uh, these are laws or bills that 
tackle the legal tender issue. Uh, states that want to form, establish their own gold bullion depository in the state. States that want to uh, hold some of their taxpayer funds, their their pension funds, their reserve funds in physical gold and silver held within the state. Um, so there are plenty of projects right now uh, that are going on. And yeah, as you mentioned, most recently, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say Alabama had already had an exemption on gold and silver. They had already decided that taxing the purchase of precious metals uh, is wrong and inappropriate. Uh, there is no other asset uh, that Alabama taxes the at the purchase of. So when you buy real estate or stocks or bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, you're not going to pay a sales tax on that good. And that's because sales taxes are uh, applied to final consumed goods. These are goods that are held for resale. So it makes no sense and it isn't appropriate to charge a sales tax. Um, and fortunately, Alabama's legislature uh, decided that um, they were going to extend the law that already existed. There was a sunset date that was coming up and they decided to push that back. Uh, Virginia did something similar as well. They had had a uh, standing law that was being edited to push back the Sunday, uh, the sunset to push it out. And then, honestly, I was hoping to be able to break some news here uh, on the show today. Um, but Tennessee, the Tennessee legislature has recently passed a law uh, eliminating sales tax on gold and silver coins and bars. Tennessee was one of the remaining nine states in the United States. There were only nine states left that still charge this unfair sales tax. And Tennessee, we're waiting on the governor's signature. Unfortunately, he has not signed it into law yet, but there is good news to report from the volunteer state. Now, there you go. Like any you know, progress we'll, we'll, we'll take, uh, particularly when there's very little being made in many other areas of the world. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, since you guys have been at this for a while, um, how has, you know, has there been any difference in the way that your interactions with, like state legislators have gone, particularly this past year, year and a half, now that inflation has gone from, you know, kind of the unseen as it was for, for a decade, you know, a lot of warnings about what Federal Reserve mismanagement was going to do. You know, a lot of the ways that we've seen inflation for the past, you know, decade plus has been in, in assets and things like that. Still very big stuff, but it doesn't quite, you know, that, that's kind of the unseen where it's the mm -hmm. scene is what we're seeing right now. Every time we go to the, you know, gas pump or the grocery store, yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, are, are, are normal sort of state legislators kind of picking up on the significance of this issue? Or is it still something that kind of gets by where you, you might have a few small, you know, like a small number of maybe passionate people that care and they kind of lead in? What's been the relationship with state legislators? I'm happy to say that the, the relationship has grown tremendously. Um, every year that we've done this, uh, we are met with good support from, uh, you know, principled politicians that are many times hearing from people in the state and deciding that they want to carry a bill to do something like this. And every time I go to testify before these committees or, or I'm, I'm in contact with any of these legislators, they, they largely are way more interested than they used to be. And inflation is something at the top of their mind now that they had never considered before. And now they're saying, wait a second, they're right. And my my testimony in these conversations that the Sound Money Defense League has and, and gets to, to communicate with these legislators, you know, is not it's it's not the very surface level antiseptic like, hey, inflation's bad and you should stop this. It's, you know, me testifying before committees telling them, hey, listen, you're you, this process, this this inflationary process, this process that doesn't allow for capital accumulation, this process that values high velocity trash in metrics as far as money goes, this process is keeping capital accumulation from happening and you're ruining generations. This is not a this is not a policy that is going to harm today. This is not a policy that is going to be able to to be done away with, you know, by the by the stroke of a pen, uh, the the stroke of a pen of of a president. You know, this is something that that has really, really horrible ripple effects out and getting to talk to these politicians, uh, you know, often all across the country, we're finding that these people are becoming more and more afraid of inflation. It's no longer a deniable problem, you know, so you, we had experts, quote unquote, these experts telling us at first there is no inflation. And then they told us inflation was transitory. And then they told us inflation was good for the working class. And now they're telling us inflation is the Putin price hike. That's what all of this is. And it, it I'm happy to say that it's becoming harder and harder to deny that this is a mere problem of government ineptitude, that these prices, what we're seeing here, it's not coincidence that trillions of dollars have been printed out of thin air over the last two or three years. And we're seeing inflation rates unlike anything we've seen in decades. This is not a, a something that happens by chance. 
And and more and more people are waking up to that. And then I, one of the things I think is interesting is that, you know, again, you know, the money for, for the longest time, we, 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 you know, I remember back in, you know, the Ron Paul campaign days, right? You know, it, it was the dismissal of money as sort of like this wonkish, uh, mm. uh, you know, very, very high minded, high intellectual sort of, of item that would never like resonate with the base. And, and part of that, you know, I, you know, I, you know I, there's a, uh, there's a very interesting book, um, The Lords of Easy Money. Um, that I, I read recently about uh, some of the history of particularly like the, the Greenspan Fed and the Bernanke Fed. Um, unfortunately, everything the author, when, when the author gives his own economic opinion in that book, it, it gets cringy very quickly. But uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things, though, I, I appreciate that they highlight is the degree to which it was a deliberate tactic of Alan Greenspan and Bernanke to use language when testifying in front of Congress, uh, when, when talking to the public during, uh, uh, you know, you know, meetings with financial press and things like that. Like they, they would intentionally use language designed to confuse and, and kind of hide the, the real mechanics of what they were doing. Um, and, and I think that has played a long way in trying to, to detach money from politics. But of course, historically, you know, this, this was a major issue, obviously, not only with the Jacksonians, but, you know, you had, had McKinley being, you know, carried in a, a litter of a gold coin, you know, back in the day on prominent campaign you know, literature and things like that. You know, in particular, and, and I think now some parallels of what we have right now, the degree to which uh, uh, inflation was a, a cause for protests throughout the country during the stagflation environment, late 70s. You know, it, it is it is interesting to see, you know, particularly with this era of American popular uh, politics, particularly on the right, that is becoming, I think, explicitly populist, at least in rhetoric, if not action. Um, you know, the degree to which this carries over to the money issue, because, you know, this really is one of those issues that, again, you know, something one of the few times you see the consequences of policy play out every single day. I mean, this is the ultimate kitchen table issue. And, and yet, you know, it's something that most political you know, politicians have no opinion on, at least haven't had an opinion on until late. Um, uh, has has there been you know, you, you mentioned that along with the tax aspect of it. Um, you know, you guys have been focusing on, I know, I think Texas was the first state to have a gold depository. Some, you know, have, have, what is the landscape out there for some of these even more ambitious steps being taken in this environment um, from some of the states? I, I know you have an, an index of kind of which states are, are, are best performing in some of your sound money metrics from a policy standpoint. Um, and what, what are some of the, the other legislative uh, uh, pitches out there that you think are, are interesting on top of uh, the, the way that you know, states may treat gold or silver as a, you know, say, a, a sales tax issue? Sure. Yeah. So real quick to something you were saying earlier about, you know, this is the ultimate kitchen table conversation. And until recently, the, the experts, the authorities, you know, haven't really had anything to say about it. And I think I, I was speaking to someone, I, I think it was um, Eric Brakey over at uh, YAL. And we were talking about how, you know, this is money tends to be one of those one of those subjects, one of those issues that is almost, you know, kept exclusively for the experts like, oh, you're not a Ph.D. Uh, you, you know, haven't studied economics. Uh, you haven't read Thomas Piketty's latest book. Uh, you know, you you, you know, stay in your lane. And it it has now normal everyday people who haven't, you know, don't don't have Ph.D.s in economics and don't. Uh, haven't studied at elite schools or finding themselves saying, hey, wait a second, I knew that this was coming. I said that this money was going to be uh, an inflationary event. And what do you mean the experts are surprised that inflation has caught us like this? This makes no sense to the normal people. So even normal people, and I think we're sort of seeing this in America as a whole, the the faith or, yeah, I guess the the faith in experts uh, seems to be waning and people are starting to think for themselves more, uh, you know, across all all matter of topics. Um, so but to your question, I think that the, the sales tax issue and the tax issue generally uh, is going to be the easiest to tackle. That's the easiest to, to get victories in. It's the one that's probably simplest for people to understand. Uh, but there is, for example, right now, we are 
hurtling towards a massive pension crisis in this country where pensions are so largely underfunded. um, And as people begin to retire, this is going to become a problem. And a lot of the problem with the underfunding has to do with projections. Uh, You know, these are these are asset managers that are promising 12, 13 percent a year. Um, And it's just it's not when when these are your plans, it's difficult to to make that that prediction become true. And then when you can't do it, you've got millions of people depending on you to to somehow make up the difference. And so there are states that are introducing legislation uh, to allow for physical gold and silver in these uh, in these accounts. Um, in many states, it's not just citizens that are hamstrung from purchasing or and owning gold and silver to protect themselves from inflation. It's also the state themselves many times. Uh, the state is uh, tied up, uh, handcuffed by many times what are called um, alternative investment rules or, or prudent investor rules uh, that don't allow for physical precious metals many times. And these are rules that allow for all sorts of, uh, you know, dollar denominated debt and uh, third world debt and all of these, you know, highly volatile, risky assets. These are allowed. The money managers say that's allowed, but a single ounce of gold, uh, it, it, you're looked at, you, you're looked at like you have multiple heads, like you're from another planet. Um, and so these kind of efforts that, that they're being introduced, you know, all over the place, out in Idaho, uh, in Oklahoma, uh, in Wyoming, you know, so we have these liberty legislators that are seeing the importance of, of having gold and silver to back their accounts, having gold and silver to back the state, uh, the, the land that they love, uh, you know, being able to secure the assets of their place of residence uh, has never been more important. And so people are flocking to it. You know, I'm, I'm so glad you, you mentioned the pension fund issue. I know this is also like, and, and that, that's one of the aspects of kind of, kind of the, the non-immediate, like sort of devaluating aspects of uh, a currency devaluation aspects of the, the, the insane monetary policy, not only the Fed, but the ECB and every other major central bank out there besides a, a select few. Um, it's, it's the degree to which, you know, when, when you're in such a low interest rate environment, the degree to which you, you have to take on higher yield assets to make up for the, you know, liabilities that you ha- that you're going to eventually have to pay out, mm-hmm. you know, which, which requires these, these institutions to load up on riskier and riskier debt. Um, now I particularly enjoy the irony of ECB policy, uh, uh being directly responsible for European banks loading up on Russian debt, uh, which is yep. not and going quite we are. <laughs> too well right now. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the, it's the snake that eats its tail. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, there's the, the dollar trilemma, this idea when you, when you live in an inflationary environment, when, when, uh, the, the country of origin is, is printing dollars the way America is, people, holders of the dollars have, of, have three options. Uh, you can get your dollars and uh, hold them uh, and be charged with a tax, an inflationary tax, a penalty for saving your money. You can spend immediately and try to get as much value out of your depreciating monetary unit as you possibly can. So you spend immediately or you throw it into the risky casino uh, that is the stock market, and you try to to beat the dealer. Um, and so none of these three options are what you want when you're talking about uh, a society that you want to be growing, right? Like so, like I mentioned earlier, it's just this high velocity idea that you know GDP rules all, and so long as uh, inflation is, or excuse me, so long as unemployment is low, you know things are zipping along, we have no problem. And it it's it's far more than that, and. More and more, I think, um, you know, people that are holding the dollar here and and overseas are starting to say, hey, wait a second, this exorbitant privilege that I've been hearing about for a long time, why is it like this? And America is frankly at risk of losing reserve currency status. I, I wouldn't be able to say when in the next year, in the next decade. But more and more, the, the moribund dollar, uh, the life of this dollar is coming to an end. Yeah, it is, it's interesting when those warnings are coming, not simply from, you know, our, our circles, but, you know, again, I'd love to point this out, but it was 2018 when the Bank of England was saying, hey, guys, the, you know, the, the Fed isn't playing above board here. The dollar is being weaponized against us. Uh, I mean, I think it was, you even had Federal Reserve officials earlier this year saying, oh, well, you know, it's possible to have more than one global reserve currency, um, <laughs> you know, and, and and of course, you know, I I, I think that you're going to end up seeing, particularly within this, this populist 
moment, this, this and, and in some cases, you know, more explicitly a, a nationalist one. You know, I, I think modern politics is going to be increasingly defined by the, the money question. Obviously, we've seen it not only play out in, in some of the, the blowback from bad economic policy and, and the war in Ukraine has only made that much, much broader since it's now a full on full fledged, you know, world world financial war. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, e- even beyond that, um, um, the degree to which, uh, uh, you know, we, we've seen you know, the banking system more broadly, I mean, explicitly weaponized for political purposes, um, you know, the increasing need for, you know, powerful bureaucrats and kind of the technocratic class to rein in free speech and, and to crack down on political dissidents. The banking sector is one of those ways that they can do it. Um, and, and that goes goes into some of the broader concerns about, you know, shifting from to, to, to uh, central bank digital currencies and all the fun, you know, very uh, a Chinese CCP style uh, tools mm-hmm. and tricks that can come with some of that. Um, uh, but, and, it's, you know, it's, Canada, Canada is such a good yeah. example of that. Right. The truckers protest and seeing how quickly, you know, people can be othered. You know, by literally the snap of a finger, the decision of I don't know who an, an unelected person, elected person, whoever it is that can that can just other you and just cut off your lifeline, your access to a financial system. And it speaks to the need for trustless institutions in money, in government, like the idea that these institutions rely on a good man, a good leader, a good woman in charge for that the institution to be working properly is a recipe for disaster. Uh, and given man's propensity for sin, it doesn't make sense to build institutions that can be weaponized. And so trustless institutions in the form of Bitcoin, things like decentralized money, things like gold standards, uh, you know, th- these are the things I think that really smart people are working on to build. Um, and that's what I'm excited about. That's why I'm bullish on on the market. The market is going to to outmaneuver the government. The governments are reactionary, reactionary institutions. They react to what people do. And I think people are largely smarter. Well, so particularly since you touched on the, the Bitcoin issue there, I, I see that Wyoming uh, is, is the, the best performer in your uh, your sound money index. Um, Wyoming, of course, uh, the, the great Caitlin Long, mm-hmm. um, the, the work that she helped uh, push you know, alongside the, the Wyoming state legislature, when, you know, wasn't wasn't her, her by herself necessarily, but you know, the the, the intellectual uh, laid the intellectual foundation for a, a whole litany of a very interesting, um, very very uh, 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 liberating uh, uh, Bitcoin and crypto legislation, both from a regulatory side of things. I believe that they opened up the ability for some uh, government institutions to hold Bitcoin in their balance sheet as well, kind of getting to. Um, some of those issues that we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what else has Wyoming done on on sort of the goal, the, the sound money issue um, that 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 makes it the leader over over a Texas or or, or Alabama or some some uh, uh, South, you know, some of these other states that you've had success in? Is is there anything in particular for that that uh, we can learn from Wyoming as an example? Because they seem to be right on the frontier of really taking it to oh, yeah. the Fed these days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wyoming has been fantastic on this issue from gold to Bitcoin to crypto generally. Um, you know, and you mentioned, you know, Caitlin didn't work by herself and you're right about that. But I think it was 2017. I was out in Wyoming. I was in Cheyenne walking the halls of the state legislature, trying to get meetings, trying to pass an, uh, a, legis- a bill that uh, eliminated all taxes on gold and silver uh, coins and bars in Wyoming. Um, sales tax, income tax, any sort of property tax, any any occupational, any any anything, they, it, any tax liability was zero on gold and silver. And we we you know were able to find many allies within the legislature. And at the same time, while we were working this sound money bill, Caitlin was there working her first. Uh, I think it was a blockchain bill. Um, and so we were, we were working the, the bills at the same time. And so I can tell you, she did not work alone, but man, she is a soldier. She is, you know, marching up and down. She is out there every day, you know, pounding the pavement, having these conversations, writing these, uh, you know, incredible articles and, and assets. Um, and so, yeah, she is of, of Mises fame. I, I met her here at the Mises Institute, uh, in, uh, man, 2015, maybe 2014. Um, Patrick so, yeah. Byrne, uh, ARC year. Right there. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, so Wyoming, I'm happy to say that Caitlin obviously has, you know, been blowing 
everything out of the water in Wyoming as far as, uh, you know, regulatory structures that allow for things like Bitcoin banks, uh, regulatory structures that allow people to transact in, allow companies to hold, allow balance sheets, allow, uh, you know, governments, the state themselves to to hold Bitcoin if they wanted to. So Caitlin has been obviously the leader uh, on that front and it's coupled with what Wyoming is doing there. And then in our index, what is uh, sales tax, uh, income tax, uh, low levels of taxation at that, um, states that have codified, reaffirmed that gold and silver are indeed money. Um, these are all things that Wyoming has checked. Um, and that's what makes Wyoming the leader uh, in, in the most recent sound money or yeah, sound money index. So do you ever get any sort of perhaps a, a generational sort of push there where, you know, perhaps you know, with, with Bitcoin, particularly, you know, coming on the mainstream in, in, in recent years. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's, it's always funny when you see, you know, whoever the, the intern is running the social media account of, you know, a politician, they'll put on laser eyes, you know, outside of Cynthia Lumens, I don't really <laughs> trust that any of them are, are, are that well read um, uh, sure. on, on, on the issue. Um, but but it is when, when you're dealing, when, when you're specializing with, with silver and, and gold, which have some benefits over Bitcoin, not only in just being you know, tangible, which I think makes a, a big deal with some people, but yet the constitutional aspect. I remember uh, uh, Ed, Ed Vieira um, uh, gave a, a wonderful talk that Ron Paul's office sponsored uh, back, I believe it was in 2012 or so, um, when I was uh, still on the Hill, um, that had a great you know, kind of historical breakdown and, and was advocating a lot of the similar stuff that you guys are pushing um, in terms of, of using the Constitution as itself an argument for these beyond any sort of economic sort of arg uh, uh, logic um, being used. Do do you get any any sort of generational sense where you're perhaps younger legislators do do they do they still see the value in gold relative to say a Bitcoin? Do you, do you find some older legislators that might be more comfortable with with, with say like you know putting gold on the balance sheet than like you know funny internet money that they don't really understand like is, is what's this, that sort of dynamic that you deal with dealing with some of these legislatures in this sort of larger battleground of, of depoliticized money if you will yeah i think so there are definitely different camps on that there there are definitely the legislators out there that uh you know, firmly, whether it be because they believe in the Constitution or because they, you know, sat around their kitchen table and grew up learning that that gold is money. Um, you know, there is a camp that believes gold and silver are fundamentally different from from something like a Bitcoin and Ethereum, any other of these digital currencies. Um, and so there, uh, I think, are people in legislatures that will vote differently because of that. But the reality is that politically, the policy that governs these two assets is incredibly different. Uh, the frameworks that, because Bitcoin has no infrastructure, so they're building banking frameworks and regulatory frameworks and, and all these different kinds of, of structures uh, so that Bitcoin can live. Um, and so I think a lot of people that are anti-Bitcoin, as far as legislators go, aren't necessarily anti-Bitcoin. They just don't understand the, the nuances, the wrinkles, all of the things that go into creating an entirely new financial system. And that scares off a lot of politicians, a lot of states even. You know, states don't want to be leaders. States don't want to be the first state to pass something. States want to hear, oh my gosh, we've had great success in 30 other states doing this policy. Okay, now we'll adopt it. Right. And so it, it every now and then you you have one of these firebrands, um, you know, that that comes out and, and really makes a strong push for it. But I think largely uh, the, there is there is a, a more so on the right, I would say, like an understanding of sound money and at least, uh, you know, a a sort of feigned respect towards, uh, you know, reduced deficits and like lowering spending. Um, but largely, I think the, the politicians are are you know, endless spenders, regardless, by and large. And, um, you know, they if if they're going to prefer, if they're going to prefer something and you're probably right in that age probably does have a lot to do with it. That probably divides among along those lines pretty well. Um, but there is a sound money group of legislators that likes gold that doesn't like Bitcoin. There are probably sound money legislators that like Bitcoin that don't like gold. Um, so so it's definitely a, a mixed bag.
Do you, do you see any sort of, of partisan breakdowns? You, you talked about uh, you know you don't think there's a, a you know, about you know the difference between politicians that are confused or perhaps don't fully understand, don't have the confidence necessarily to act on something like Bitcoin, um, and and you know as, as a different category than those who are adamantly against it. And I think that is, that is an important distinction. Um, you know, it, it's it, it's interesting because I, I know at the federal level you've had I mean some some of the legislators that have been the most savvy. On the issue, um, you know, once upon a time, it, 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 there, there were several, you know, Democrats kind of prominently out there for it. Um, one of them being Jared Polis, who's now the governor of Colorado, um, who was an original you know, founding member of the Blockchain Caucus that they they started. Um, you know, you, you have a little bit of that sort of, um, you know, progressive tech bro sort of vibe. You know, a little bit of like a, the Andrew Yangish sort of vibe that's that's out there with some Democrats. And yet then you also have on the other side the view that, you know, kind of puts anything that they can't control as being the embodiment of, of you know, white supremacy. Right. You know, and, and whatever the generic evil of the day is, that's what Bitcoin is um, because they can't control it. Um, do, do you see that dynamic play out at the state level or is there perhaps um, – and, and I, I could see an argument where the incentive structure, you know, R- Ryan and I have talked a lot about the differences between how the, the operations are in state legislatures relative to the circus of Congress. Is there perhaps at the federal level an incentive structure for some of these Democrats going for national donations to make these big, ridiculous, absurd displays over being very angry at, you know, whatever Peter Thiel or Elon Musk like? Um, or, or, or is there still a... Uh, uh, you know, let's, let's call it a, a, a pragmatic, uh, uh, you know, type of democratic legislator out there that is open to conversations, perhaps not only in Bitcoin, but gold, silver, or is this in your experience tends to be something that is a tea party, Ron Paul, you know, constitutionalist sort of a remnant in, in your style of politician? You know what? I don't think that sound money is a partisan issue. Sound money is political, but it is not partisan. What I mean by that is that for the last six years, I have worked in Tennessee to pass legislation, and it was here on the seventh year of trying that we finally passed it. Alternatively, we've introduced legislation in places like Hawaii, places like New Jersey, places like Pennsylvania that have passed out of committees uh, overwhelmingly, unanimously. Um, So I don't believe that this is drawn across party lines. And in fairness, to to the extent that they need fairness, to like the progressives who who build a campaign, who who build a personality uh, around being mad at Elon Musk, there, (laughs) there I think is, especially in the Bitcoin space, there's a lot of, I I don't want to, call it outright grifting, but a lot of politicians that are, you know, pounding themselves on the chest, calling themselves lovers of Bitcoin and, you know, calling themselves sound money advocates. And these guys wouldn't know Hazlitt from Hayek. And so you have a lot, I think you have a lot of pretenders. And I think that's the nature of politics, right? Because we're talking about a popularity contest. So to the extent that these things can make you more popular among your base, it makes sense to adopt them. If the if the game you're playing is is one of ethics or morals or, or anything other than political gain, yeah, okay, that's a different conversation. But um, so, since we've talked about the state level stuff, uh, one of the last topics I want to talk with you is federal level stuff. Do, do you guys do you, have, do you guys do much? on the federal level at all? Um, do, do you guys see perhaps a, you know, given everything that we've talked about with the political environment and, and the way that, again, inflation being the number one issue in America right now, do, do you see an opportunity there for perhaps some action at the federal level? Um, I, I know um, uh, uh, one of my favorite all-time pieces of legislation from Ron Paul was his competing currency bill. Um, which I, I preferred over, you know, in the Fed, obviously, is a, is a great book title. And, and you know, that, that's that's the goal. Right. But it's a little you know harder to pass. Um, you know, that, that you, you talk about a lack of courage at the state level. You have no, you know, it takes, takes a whole lot of level of courage at the federal level, which is even less in supply there. Um, uh, even even audit the Fed, I, I've got my own political reasons for preferring the, the public to be afraid of the big scoop, spooky bank that we can't audit rather than trying to explain an actual central bank audit, even if there's a lot of good information, a lot of genuine scandals that you find. Uh, I remember there was, there was a, there was a, a temporary, um, there was a limited audit after uh, Dodd-Frank, 
where like, you know, zero hedge was like full of days, like how much, you know, th- you know, how much we were bailing out European banks. And like, this, this should have been like a massive scandal, but you know, it's a little harder to explain, uh, you know, the actual practices of central banking even yeah. Um, uh, but the, the, the competitive currency bill accomplished at, or was, was attempting to accomplish at the national level, a lot of the stuff that you're doing here at the state level, um, particularly with the way that gold, silver, um, I believe it, yeah, again, this was kind of right when Bitcoins became big, maybe cryptocurrency would have to be added. Um, but, but eliminating that federal capital gains tax, um, which, which is something that, you know, this, the beauty of this is something that can be done on a, a tax bill that requires 50 plus one votes rather than 60 votes or, you know, stacking the fed with a bunch of, of, of intellectuals, um, that are sympathetic to some of these views, which are hard to find, um, with NDC, uh, uh, do you, do you, do you guys see an opportunity at that federal level to, to perhaps strike with the iron's hot and some of this stuff? I certainly hope that there is an opportunity. And there are people in Congress that are, are making this their chief issue um, or among their chief, is- chief issues. Congressman Alex Mooney from West Virginia just won his primary yesterday. Yes. A contested um, one that's... against a fellow member. I'm sorry, what? That was a contested primary against another sitting Republican oh, member. It was a fun yeah. uh, that was, that was a yeah. throwdown. Yeah, but now now coming up in a mansion, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how that race plays out. Um, but. Yeah, so uh, Congressman Mooney has been championing the sound money issue on the federal level uh, here for several years. You know, he has pa- or excuse me, introduced uh, legislation to do things like audit the Fed, to uh, not just audit the Fed, but audit the gold, uh, audit uh, Fort Knox, and do an assay, an actual test of the gold, and then uh, requires the the Federal Reserve or the Treasury to uh, to write a report and to explain uh, what gold in here. Is allocated where? Is any of this gold encumbered? Is it swapped? Is it leased? Is it uh, is does someone else partially own this gold? Does it have any any uh, you know any uh, encumbrances upon it? Um, and so Mooney through that, um, and then obviously uh, the Sound Money Caucus. Uh, Warren Davidson uh, started the Sound Money Caucus uh, probably eighteen months ago now, um, and we've had calls with them as well to kind of talk about uh, how we can work together and and what we can do to to educate uh, the the fe- federal politicians. Um, like you mentioned, um, and I guess like I mentioned, it is unbelievably difficult to get anything done on the federal level. Uh, it is like walking through quicksand, walking through mud. Uh, it's its just, it, it is impossible to get anything done. The gridlock makes it impossible. And that's why I think for us, at least, the idea that doing it on the state level would be more effective, that's why that was so appealing to us. And I think that seems to be the strategy, the way to do it. Like federally, we're not going to get anything done. So pass laws on the state level, go, go more, go smaller, go more community based, because that's where you can actually make a change. And that that's why I, I encourage people to be an active participant in an active participant in their legislature. Like, yeah, you, who you who you vote for for president is probably not going to be the vote that makes a difference. But you can make actual change at the local level to to affect policies that actually affect your life. Yeah, I got to rattle the saber a little bit here in Florida because for for all of the other areas where uh, DeSantis has led on some of these issues, I, I do not we, we have not seen a lot of uh, action on the money issue. Even though uh, you got uh, Suarez down there, yeah, yeah. Well, we have, we're trying. And yeah, the, the Miami mayor he's doing some interesting stuff. Uh, though he was a he was an anti DeSantis Republican back in the day. So oh, interesting. Uh, which, which which matters only because of the degree of which you know it, it, it influences some of his power and what he can get done at Tallahassee. But. Sure. Uh, uh, it, it is a it, we, we spend uh, uh, every year the, the state buys, I think, like 30 million dollars of foreign debt um, from one specific country. And it's like, man, we got we got to stop. Stop doing that. Stop, <laughs> stop buying these these uh, you know, government bonds. Let's get some at the very least, get some gold. Yeah. yeah and I, so I, I, Florida, I think gold could be. I'm glad I'm glad you brought this up because Florida, I'm sad to say, has one of the most egregious wrinkles uh, in in all of these laws. Uh, most states have passed what are called full, what we call full exemptions of gold and silver. Florida is one of six states that has what we call a threshold. In the law, it says that if you buy gold and silver in Florida, if the order is above $500, it's tax-free. There's no tax. But if you're buying in small amounts under $500, you're charged a tax. So the the dollar cost investors, the the people who are buying a couple silver eagles at a time, you know, every paycheck, these are people that are taxed. And the the big the the big 
over $500 are not taxed. And so I know you're big down in the Florida scene. If you know anyone who wants to end this ridiculous, outdated practice in Florida, please have them call me. So, uh, JP, before we go, um, one other thing that uh, is a housekeeping issue uh, with, with, with the work that you guys do. I know that there is a uh, essay contest on sound money that you guys do every year. We've had a lot of great Mises U alums uh, uh, win it in the past. Um, and uh, looking at some of the judges you have for uh, uh, this year, I see some, some familiar names. Um, can you talk a little bit about the essay contest and uh, how can our audience if you got if you made it this far to the episode, then, then you're you're probably uh, uh, one one of the people that could actually write a full essay on the the importance of the sound money issue. I'm going to just share with our audience a little bit uh, about that contest you guys got. Yeah, so we've been doing since I believe 2017. We've done the uh, sound money scholarship. Uh, we have been honored to have uh, Blue Ridge Blue Ribbon uh, panels of judges. Uh, these are people who lecture at Mises U. These are uh, academics in uh, at different schools across the country. These are people that have their finger on the pulse on political and economic issues across the country. And that includes people like Jeff Deist, uh, Peter Klein, Bob Murphy, uh, Keith Weiner, and yours truly, Tho Bishop, will be joining us on our panel this year. We're honored to have him. Um, so yeah, the, every year uh, we ask students, uh, high school seniors, undergrads, and graduate students to write uh, about 800 to 1,200 words on one of the prompts on the website. Um, the website, you can find that at moneymetals.com slash scholarship. Uh, these are questions about uh, monetary issues, economic issues from a free market Austrian perspective. Um, and then we go through them. The judges, uh, the, you know, this blue ribbon panel of judges uh, read the essays, grade the essays, and then we will present the winners. We'll publish them. And there is a, a monetary prize as well. Um, so if you have any interest in this, if you want to have an interest in economics, if you want to be published, and if you want to earn a couple extra bucks to go to school to, to mitigate some of the outrageous cost that is uh, paying for tuition to go to a school, um, please feel free, moneymetals.com slash scholarship, um, and you find more information there. Okay, we'll include a link in the show notes uh, on our various platforms. But uh, JP, this has been a fun conversation. Keep the great work. Uh, and and as, as a frequent Mises Wire contributor, documenting uh, some of the, these important uh, changes being you know, being made out there, or in some cases, maintaining the gains that we have already made. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if people are, are interested more in this topic, uh, they, they can find your byline at the Mises Wire um, there as well. So uh, always a pleasure talking, JP. Yeah, great seeing you, though. Until next time, this has been Bo Bishop. This has been Radio Rothbard. Yeah.